I'm going to get right to it. This episode is all about intermittent fasting for women in the middle, the middle of life and maybe the middle of stress. So whether it is working for you, it isn't working for you, you have tried it or you haven't tried it, this is probably an episode you do not want to skip. It is actually me with a good friend and a personal favorite of our Flipping 50 community, Cynthia Thurlow is joining us today. And we're talking about not just her new book, we are talking about that. And it's probably something you're going to want to get your mitts on. And I'll talk to you about why. But you're also going to want to tune in to some of the quotes and statistics that she shares. And it is a wonderfully rich informative podcast. So I've got one of the most globally recognized experts with me today talking about the what's and the why's and the when's as well as the when not to's, uh, all related to intermittent fasting. If you've dabbled, you've shunned it, you've been tempted, chances are you still have some questions. So we'll answer many here in our discussion. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns, and I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset, possibly about what to eat and how to move, so that you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. And just a quick, this episode is brought to you by the Flipping 50 five-day flip. So if you're needing to start exercise or you're new to exercise, needing to restart exercise, or you like me are a tried and true veteran exerciser, but what you're doing is not working, this could be just the restart, restart, reset that you need. Five super short workouts that you can do in the comfort of your own home. And each day I talk to you about the exact what's and why's and how this exercise supports a more balanced hormonal approach. All right, let's dive in. My guest, Cynthia Thurlow, is a nurse practitioner, CEO, and founder of the Everyday Wellness Project and international speaker with over 10 million views for her second TEDx talk, Intermittent Fasting Transformational Technique. With over 20 years of experience in health and wellness, Cynthia is a globally recognized expert in intermittent fasting and nutritional health. She's been featured on, get this, ABC, Fox 5, KTLA, CW, Medium, Entrepreneur, and The Megan Kelly Show. She's listed in Yahoo Finance as one of the 21 founders changing the way we do business. Cynthia hosts the Everyday Wellness Podcast, considered one of the 21 podcasts to expand your mind in 2021 by Business Insider. Her mission is to educate women on the benefits of intermittent fasting and overall holistic health and wellness so they feel empowered to live their most optimal lives. Cynthia, thanks so much for being here. I know it's been a whirlwind for you, but I can't wait to talk to you about this new book. Yeah, I've been really looking forward to our conversation. And, you know, it's always wonderful to connect with you and your community. Well, and like-minded communities, I think mm-hmm. that we both share. And I want to really kind of break things down for our midlife women here specifically. Intermittent fasting is always going to be a hot topic. I think we're probably for the rest of our lives, we'll be, mm-hmm. we'll be bringing it up. We'll be talking about it. We'll be making game-changing relevations, I think, for future generations and how this will be used. But let's talk a little bit about A wide gamut of listeners. I mean, some are some are still having regular menstrual cycles. Some are not at all, kind of flirting between perimenopause, postmenopause. And I got to tell you, sister, I'm over two years into menopause, and for some reason, I'm I'm spotting. (laughs) I mean, yeah, all the wonderful things that you didn't know could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talk about intermittent fasting and life stage like this differences in use of intermittent fasting? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And and one that I feel like in many ways has really not gotten enough attention by a lot of the fasting experts that are out there, which is why I, I felt like that was such a perfect opportunity to really speak directly to women. And so we know in perimenopause and, and menopause that we don't, we, there are, I, I was, let's, let's reframe this. When I think about perimenopause, you know, this time when um, we have wavering hormones. So we have progesterone that is, there's less progesterone being produced by our ovaries, our adrenals pick up the slack, which means we don't deal with stress quite as effectively as we once did. We can't buffer it the same way. We get this relative estrogen dominance, which can manifest in a lot of different ways. It might be a weight gain or fibrocystic breasts. We may have heavier periods, as I affectionately refer to them, the crime scene period. You know, when we have lowered progesterone, we may have more anxiety and depression. Hello, antidepressants and anti-anxiety agents that are given out to women like candy at this stage of life. We may also not have as restful sleep because progesterone plays a large role in upregulating GABA production, which, you know, allows us to relax and fall asleep. And so there's many different things that we will, you know, start seeing as we make this transition from, you know, cycling peak fertility into this five to 10 year period of perimenopause before we transition into menopause effectively. And really my work with intermittent fasting started in perimenopause. I got stuck. And by stuck, I mean, I wasn't, I, you know, seemed to over seemingly overnight, uh, stopped sleeping well, had no energy, put on, you know, 10 pounds on a five foot three frame, which was not my norm and was just otherwise really flummoxed and intermittent fasting for me. and, And for so many of my patients and clients has been, instrumental in allowing people to feel a whole lot better and maybe even feel better than they did in their twenties and thirties. And so when we're looking at women in middle age, we really have to talk about lifestyle medicine. You cannot uh, behave the way that you did in your twenties and thirties, meaning sleep becomes much more important. Stress management becomes critical. Anti-inflammatory nutrition, and I'm not going to make a broad-based statement and say that every single woman needs to eat the same way So we do have to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. We can't, um, we just don't buffer uh, inflammatory foods. And I'll give you some examples like dairy and gluten. And it's very bio-individual. Alcohol is another one, processed sugars. And so we make choices. And for many of us, I think we want to be in a position where we still have lots of energy. We have a libido. uh, We sleep really well. We can exercise. We can interact with our loved ones and contribute to our community And I feel like this is a stage when women can either really take some time to examine what what serves them and what no longer serves them. And I'm going to speak specifically to the dogma, the diet dogma that we all grew up with, where we were told breakfast was the most important meal of the day. And that meal frequency was really important, that that helped stoke your metabolism. And I would actually argue that that combined with the bastardization of fats has left most of us and certainly a whole generation, generations of women that are trying to figure out what's going on. You can't out-exercise a bad diet. You cannot uh, obsessively count calories and think that's going to be the most effective way to manage weight gain. And so I do think, you know, when, when you and I come together and we talk about these things, that navigating middle age requires a bit of finesse. And one of the strategies that I think can be profoundly impactful is eating less often. And it could be as simple as you skip breakfast and then you have lunch and dinner. Uh, It could be as simple as you have, you know, you break your fast at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning and then you eat another meal and then you shut your your feeding window down and you don't eat in between. And that is so counterintuitive to certainly how I was raised. I had an Italian mother and breakfast was the most important meal of the day and lots of carbohydrates. And so it really makes us reflect when we get into this stage of our lives and we realize that the things that used to work no longer work as effectively or effectively at all, that we have to kind of re what we want our 40s, 50s and beyond to be like. And the reframe that I always like to focus on is that we spend on average 40% of our lifetime in menopause. And that's really sobering because I, I think for many women, they think they drop off a cliff mm-hmm. when they hit 50, 52, 53 Average age of menopause in the United States is 51. So you'll have women that will go through earlier and women that will go through later. But it's really interesting to me how, you know, when you reframe it in that way, 
it re- makes women realize like, I want to ensure this second, you know, it's a reverse puberty or the second stage of my life is really going to be set up so that I have as much success as possible. Totally agree. And I think if you look at like where do women start perimenopause, mm-hmm. I mean, we could even say that, I mean, a woman spends 60% of her life. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're going to go for triple digits yeah. in some stage of menopause. Yeah. Yeah. And we just kind of, oh, it's downhill. Forget right. that. Right. Well, and it's it's interesting. I was talking to a woman yesterday and I was bringing up the fact that there's a lot of shame for women about aging. There's a lot of shame. Um, you know, they, they feel like they're forgotten. And these are words that my patients use. They feel forgotten. They feel neglected. They feel invisible. And so, you know, we're in a society where a lot of other cultures really admire and revere um, people that are in middle or later ages and there are a lot of people who still embrace the ideology that once you're over a certain age, you're irrelevant. And, and I think we really have to start that reframe because the women I know that are in perimenopause and menopause are total badasses. Like they're doing amazing things with their careers and their family and traveling and, you know, on talking, speaking on platforms about topics that need to be talked about. And so changing that narrative and not really embracing or wanting to align with this kind of shame that I I know my mother never admits her age. My mother's been telling us since she was probably 35 years old that she's 35 every year. And it's become a running joke, but I finally just said, you know, what's the big deal? Like I, I kind of think it's far more interesting to just be honest about what age and stage we're in and to wear it with pride that we shouldn't feel like we have to live in the shadows or that we're somehow um, silenced because we no longer have a functioning uterus and ovaries. I totally agree. I think we flirt back and forth with this whole thing of, I do think there is a shift, you know, Mm -hmm. that now it is. It's like a badge. It's like, well, no, like this is, you know, 58. Like this is what it looks like today in 2022, you know, or at least it does for me. Right. And, and yet on the other hand, I think any one of us, I know I'm guilty of this too, can catch ourselves saying, oh, it's hell to get old. Right. Mm-hmm. And we still fall back on, you know, talking about ourselves at whatever age we are at the moment as an old thing. Um, so I think it will be wrestling with that, that desire to think more positively about aging and, and look and feel a certain way and defy what we've seen before, but we'll have to help ourselves out. Like say, no, 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 we're not going to say that on my watch. You should mm-hmm. see me go after the women in my community when I hear them say, I'm such an old lady that workout killed me. And I'm like, no, we're not using that language in here. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like, you don't even know what you just did to me. So <laughs> I know. And I think it's so, um, you know, it's interesting. Like I have women on my team mm-hmm. that age and range from like 25 to 55. And it's such a cool thing to see, you know, the younger women and the women that are my peers. And when we all get together and we talk and we can really all speak to one another from different angles. And it's such a beautiful thing. And that's really what it should be is, you know, this delicate kind of flourishing relationships that we have. I mean, I I did a IG live last week out of frustration because there's, as you know, a fair amount of negativity on social media. And, uh, you know, I, I watched some middle-aged women go after a younger woman and they didn't fully understand what they were even talking about. And I affectionately refer to people like this as harpies. And so I just said, you know, this is not the platform that I want to stand on. I'm not going to come from a place of lack. I'm going to come from a place of abundance. And that's the type of client that I attract. And I'm sure it's the same type of client you attract. And so I think we really have to stand as examples of, you know, we're human, of course, but, you know, helping to change that narrative that you can still live like vibrant, healthy, sexy, happy lives and be north of 30. And, 
you know, hopefully over time, I mean, I, I love seeing actresses in Hollywood that continue to have great careers past the age of 35 or 30 mm-hmm. and certainly uh, see people that are casted appropriately. That was one of the things that I thought was so humorous when a friend pointed that out. And I said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with youth. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. But I want women to feel equally comfortable saying there's absolutely nothing wrong with aging. And we can laugh about the funny things that happen. I mean, let's be honest, that's that's enjoyable because if you, you know, I, I think it's important to have a sense of humor, but by the same token, you know, let's not sit back and just grieve all the things that are different. Let's look forward to the things that are coming and changing and evolving and shifting. I mean, I, I feel on many levels, levels that women in middle age really find their voices. All of a sudden, they're not afraid to speak their minds. They're not afraid to... Uh, you know, politely to disagree to, you know, they politely agree to disagree. And I do have colleagues of mine that we don't always agree on things and that's totally okay, but we do so respectfully. But, you know, I, I think we really need to set the tone for younger generations so that they aren't looking as if they, again, drop off that cliff after the age of 45 or 50 or whatever age it is that they they have in their mind that suddenly life ends suddenly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so for for all the women who are listening, and that that includes all of our flipping fifty regular listeners, but I also invite you to invite your daughters, you know, or those younger women who you mentor to listen to this one, as, especially for this next question. So, specifically for women, what are the benefits that might be unique to them for fasting? I think that's a really great question that when we look at women, um, you know, irrespective of whether they're at peak fertility years, perimenopause or menopause, I really think that it's, it's a wonderful way to balance key hormones like insulin. We know that 88.2% of the population, and I'm not sure how it shakes down between genders uh, based on that 2018 study, uh, 88.2% of our population is metabolically inflexible. And so the downstream effect is that that's driven by insulin resistance. And so one of the first things that I talk about specific to women is that if your insulin levels are high, there are a lot of things that are going to not work properly. And it could be wonky menstrual cycles. It could be, um, you know, when you're younger, maybe you're dealing with infertility issues. It could be when you're older that you have stubborn, resistant weight gain. You may be leptin resistant as well. So really starting from the point of, better hormonal regulation. You know, a lot of people, a lot of women are estrogen dominant at this stage of our our lives. And they'll say, well, how is that possible? If I have less estrogen in my body, especially at the latter stages of perimenopause and menopause, um, unless someone's on hormone replacement therapy, they're very likely in a low estrogen state, but we can have uh, estrogen exposure that comes from our food, our environment, our personal care products and estrogen mimicking chemicals. So when you lose weight, uh, as an example, with with uh, intermittent fasting, you can actually help balance uh, the estrogen in the body in, in beneficial ways. And so I, I think about that. I think about the sleep piece for a lot of women. They're having this roller coaster of blood sugar dysregulation and poor quality sleep and hot flashes. And I have women in programs that have literally done nothing else other than they are now eating less often and slowly making dietary changes. And all of a sudden their hot flashes are gone. And all of a sudden they're not waking up three times a night. And all of a sudden, you know, they're not getting drenched in sweat in the middle of the day. And this is even without medication. This is purely based on meal frequency, because we know that based on research, people oftentimes with the worst hot flashes are the ones that have the greatest blood sugar dysregulation. So again, going back to eating less often will help stabilize your blood sugar, your insulin, your estrogen, so many other things. I think about just those biophysical markers. I talk a lot about labs, but we know it improves your triglycerides. Um, We know that as one example, that estrogen is also insulin sensitizing, which means when we have abundant levels of estrogen, when we're younger, we are less likely to deal with insulin resistance. But as we get older, perimenopause, menopause, we are more likely to become insulin resistant. Even if you are a healthy weight, even if you exercise, even if you are eating a healthy diet, your cells just become desensitized to insulin in response to this lower estrogen state within the body. And so there are so many benefits. I think about the uh, process of autophagy. 
which although that is not unique to women, I think it's important for women to understand that this waste and recycling process really only gets ramped up when we're not eating. So if you think about the average American is eating anywhere from 10 to 12 times a day, when you go from 10 to 12 times a day down to two or three, all of a sudden, you know, you have the benefits of upregulation of getting rid of, it's like taking out the trash in the body. Autophagy is really like taking out dead organelles and diseased mitochondria and all these cellular components that our body doesn't need anyway. It just allows us to become more efficient. And so along with all those things, we know we get a significant degree of, um, you know, cognitive improvement. So we're much more mentally clear because our insulin levels are low. So you'll hear these reoccurring themes. And as it pertains to women, what really makes us unique with fasting is our physiology. And so it's the cycling of progesterone and estradiol, which is the predominant form of estrogen prior to going through menopause. It's the symphony between these two hormones that interacts with the strategy of fasting and harnessing the benefits of the two hormones to decide when do we put the accelerator on and when do we put the brakes on? And so, you know, when I look at women and I talk to women, we really start with the basics. We really start with sleep quality. We talk about stress management, which I know you do as well, and exercise and movement and the choice of foods that we're eating. And that combined with with intermittent fasting can really be a profoundly impactful strategy and something that most women especially in middle age and beyond can do throughout their lifetime. So it's not as if it's a get quick fix um, concept. Like we have been schooled with, you know, growing up in the, uh, the health and fitness industry that really pushes the latest, greatest thing. I always say the box, the bag, the can of stuff. And what we really want to empower women to be able to do is to utilize strategies that they can use throughout their lifetime and to be able to do it independently and to feel empowered and inspired and not feel like they have to sit back and cower in a corner and feel like their needs aren't being met, which is, again, I'm just echoing comments that a lot of my my clients and patients will make to me that I always share in the context of, I want women to know they're not alone. Mm, Very rich. Okay. I want to go back to something. This is going to be one of of the things I'm sure we'll come back to again and again, but 88.2% of the population is metabolically inflexible. Mm -hmm. So for our audience members who are just maybe still not sure they grasp that content or that concept, can you define again metabolic flexibility? Yeah. So what what happens in the United States and a lot of westernized countries is that this chronic and habitual overeating puts their body into using off um, carbohydrates for energy And when we're flexible, when we're metabolically flexible, our body goes back and forth between stored energy, which is fat, and then, you know, carbohydrates, which are a quick source of energy. So think of it as my stepfather always liked filling, topping off the gas tank. So our gas tanks, when they're empty, that's when we can tap into those fat stores for energy. But most of us are eating so frequently that we never get to get through our supply of gas. So I I think that's always such a great analogy that... The, the really simple way to utilize fuel is to use up carbohydrates, but it's going to give you a quick source of non-sustained energy. You're going to get energy slumps. You're going to get hungry in between meals. You're going to deal with stubborn fat loss or weight loss resistance versus when you can use effectively flip back and forth between carbs and fats for energy, you're going to have sustained energy. You are not going to have energy slumps. Um, you are going to be able to go from one meal to the next without getting hungry you will be able to lose weight when you need to or change body composition. And so on a very elementary level, this is the way our bodies are designed to thrive, but we haven't given ourselves the opportunity to do that because we're eating three meals a day and snacks and snacking after dinner and drinking a lot of alcohol in the evening. Um, and, and these things contribute to not having that, that, that flexibility. And this is what is at the basis for most, if not all health problems that we're seeing right now, high blood pressure, diabetes, insulin resistance, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, specific types of cancers, a lot of neurodegenerative um, cognitive issues, especially Alzheimer's, which we affectionately refer to as type 3 diabetes. Uh, These are all issues related to the inability to use stored energy effectively. And so you just keep storing and storing and storing energy 
And that's where things get to be problematic. Great definition. Okay. I want to ask you this question, and this is a little divergent from literally the science on intermittent fasting, but I think very relative to my audience who may perceive this as, you know, this is too hard. I could never do that. You know, we're talking to insulin resistance. I think there may be a little bit of intermittent fasting resistance going on (laughs) here for for those who think, well, you know, my social life or, you know, getting up in the morning and putting cream in my coffee, I could never give that up or, you know, uh, cocktails, you know, and then it goes into dinner. I mean, how am I going to change that? What what do you say to that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, we all have limiting beliefs, right? Uh, I can tell you the first time I entertained the idea of intermittent fasting, I thought it sounded crazy. And then once I started doing it, I felt so good. I was like, heck, I don't, I don't care if it sounds crazy. I feel great. But I think when, when, when women are considering this as a strategy, it's really with the understanding and the undertaking that you start slow. You don't go from eating three meals a day and snacks and having cream in your coffee to effortlessly going to 18 hours of fasted, there's a whole process. And I teach everyone that process in my book, Intermittent Fasting Transformation, because I think that slow and steady is what wins. You know, the comparisonitis, because there's always people on social media that are extremists. And I always say, you just put your blinders on. And and here's the beautiful thing that you don't miss out on celebrations. You don't miss out on dinners with friends. You don't miss out on special life events. The beauty of fasting is it's flexible. So you can move your fasting window all over the place, whether you're on vacation or not. And you can even not fast one day out of the week. I mean, there's so much variability. And I I think for so many women, they're very rigid. You know, they're kind of dogmatic in their thinking and very rigid. And they're like, okay, if I do fasting, I have to do the same thing every day for the rest of my life. And I remind them, much like you would not do the same exercise routine every day, Please God. Yeah. Yeah. You don't do the same fasting routine every day. You don't eat the same foods every day. And so I think it's important for women to understand that it may take four to six weeks to become metabolically flexible or more flexible than where they are. But when you have those special events, you just move your feeding and fasting windows around. And when you're starting out, you may just go from dinner at six o'clock at night to, you know, having that coffee with cream at eight o'clock in the morning. And that's 14 hours. What a lot of people don't realize is a lot of the time spent fasting, you are sleeping. And so that's the beauty of it all. Like you may spend nine hours in bed and nine hours of which you've been fasting. So it's really exciting for me when I can provide some um, reassurance that you don't have to be rigid and you can still enjoy time with loved ones and on vacation. And you just move your windows around. Like if I know I'm having a, a dinner out Uh, I will break my fast a little later. And so I'm still eating within my window. I'm just eating a little later. And I think it's also uh, important for people to understand to really, if you're metabolically flexible and you're you're at a healthy weight, you can intuitively eat. But I find most other women have to get to a point where the hormones are better regulated in their bodies. And so we touched on a couple of them. But once you're able to, you know, get those hormones better aligned and the communication between satiety and hunger, um, et cetera, are are better aligned and there's better communication between your brain and your stomach and your fat cells, all of a sudden there's a whole new world opened up. That is awesome. I, I love it. So, so well said, so well answered. Thanks for hitting that. For, for those women who are doing it or trying it. And it's not working. Mm -hmm. Um, First of all, maybe what would be some signs that intermittent fasting isn't working? Yeah, that's a great question and an important one. So first and foremost, I use the menstrual cycle. If you're still menstruating, I use the menstrual cycle as as a vital sign. So if you are regular like clockwork, even in perimenopause, and you start fasting and your period goes away, and I'm not just talking about like one cycle, but it goes away you may want to look to see if this is too much stress for the body. So intermittent fasting is a hormetic stress, a beneficial stress in the right amount at the right time, a lot like exercise or cryotherapy or infrared sauna or certain types of HIIT, high intensity interval training. So that's really how we have to view that. So significant changes in your menstrual cycle, 
Um, obviously, if you're menopausal, it's not an issue, but I, I do occasionally run across women who suddenly stop menstruating altogether. And they're just too young for that to be happening. Like if you're early stages of perimenopause, you shouldn't lose your menstrual cycle. If you're 52, it may be purely coincidental, but you want to get that checked out. Number two, if you're not sleeping well, that's a sign it might be too much stress. And, and I find for a lot of women, it's because they're not putting their macros together properly, meaning they're too much carbohydrate, not enough protein, maybe the wrong types of fat. So really making sure you're getting good quality macronutrients in during your feeding window. Sleep can also be exacerbated by stress. And again, I talked about hermetic stress, how that's beneficial stress in the right amount at the right time. Sometimes there's just too much stress going on in someone's life. And so if you're not sleeping, your cortisol's up, you feel antsy, may not be the right time. I also would be remiss. I know there are women who still are having babies into their 40s. So I want to say that when women are pregnant and breastfeeding, I'm not supportive of people fasting. Um, and sometimes that can be problematic. But I would say that the, the things I've identified as well as energy issues. So you should have more energy when you're fasting. And if you're not that can be a problem. It could be a sign of a variety of different things going on. It could be not enough nutrients, dehydration, not enough electrolytes. There's a lot of troubleshooting that can go on, but those are the typical ones, sleep issues, cycle issues, energy issues. Um, and then sometimes, you know, tying in the reproductive piece, because I, I do occasionally get questions, women who are going through IVF in their mid forties, you know, wondering if they can, if they can fast effectively. And I generally am, am very discouraging. I always say it's the one time in your life that, and when you're breastfeeding, I don't want you um, restricting the amount of macronutrients you're consuming because your body's in a growth state at that point, or you're feeding another human and definitely don't want you to lose out on nutrition for them as well. But those are the more common signs that it may not be working. And the, the last thing that I want to kind of dovetail into there is to say that, you know, fasting is not right for every single woman. I have some women who will epi episodically fast. They'll find a few months where their stress is under control and they're not doing a lot of traveling and uh, they're able to kind of buffer what's going on in their personal and professional lives. And then when the stress picks up, they back off on fasting. And so I, I think there, there's no shame in admitting that there are times when it doesn't work. I think the best example I can give personally is that in 2019, I was hospitalized for 13 days and lost 15 pounds. And you better believe I wasn't fasting for a while because I just wasn't back to a healthy weight um, and didn't want to run the risk of continuing to lose more weight. So I think there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with putting the pause button on. Great advice. Thanks so much. Okay. I'd love to ask you just a couple of questions, literally about the book. Mm -hmm. what, what are you most proud of? about this book? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> this program really, uh, really came out of my business kind of exploding. Like it's almost like someone took a fire cap off of a fire hydrant. And so trying, trying to mitigate uh, a demand for a service that I hadn't even created. So I have 45 is really the boots on the ground, grassroots effort to accommodate the needs of women who were looking for support immediately after that second TED talk came out. So I'm I'm proud that that we that I was able to kind of spend two years tweaking and fine tuning it, and being able to um, you know it almost feels like a birth. It's kind of a strange thing when you write a book. People have said that to me. I didn't really appreciate it, but I'm really proud that. I, you know, I was able to pivot and respond as quickly as I was because I, I really believe that there are there are thousands, if not millions, of women who would benefit from the information in the book, but not everyone can work with me. And so now, you know, anyone and everyone has the ability to feel like I'm right there with them, walking them through the process, how to successfully fast, giving background about the science, the hormones what makes women unique, What you, how you have to fast differently depending on where you are in your life stage. And this book is also for cycling women that are still in their peak fertile years too. So it really is a, a labor of love um, and being able to impact women on a greater level because there hasn't been a book written by a woman for women on fasting. And so I'm really very grateful um, to be able to do that. It, I, I acknowledge that not everyone has the ability to do that. And so I'm, I sit in complete gratitude, but I would say the thing I'm most proud about is that IF45 was really born out of a demand. And this is now 
now I have an opportunity to share it with the world. Love it. And I have to have to let everybody know. So I have a copy on my nightstand and <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about any other woman out there, but I have an idea that this is something we all do. So I often will read like cookbooks before I go to bed mm-hmm. and, you know, it's part of like, okay, this is a time I can kind of plan and think about what do I want to do for this next coming week. But the recipes are to mm. die for. Somebody could buy it just for that. Yeah. Well, I, I feel really fortunate that there was a woman that I, I met on social media who's absolutely lovely, Beth Lipton. I think she's one of the most talented, talented chefs that's out there. And we struck up a friendship. This is several years ago. And I told her at one point, I said, if we ever have an opportunity to collaborate, I would love to do that. And so when uh, when I when I went through the whole auction and, and book process. I said, I know exactly who I want to write the recipes for this book. And, and we're so very aligned in our kind of nutritional philosophies. We wanted healthy, nutritious, easy to cook food uh, that would be nutrient dense. And obviously I'm the first person to say we as women need to eat more protein. So it's very a very protein focused book, but designed to be, uh, you know, the recipes are designed to be uh, quick to put together. There are little to no unusual ingredients. Um, it's really just focused on good, clean, healthy, nutrient dense uh, meals, and you know, making sure that it's kind of an accessible entry point. You know, I, I love. I'm like a big foodie, and so my husband and I love to try different types of cuisines and foods. And the one thing that I've started to find as I get older is I don't want to spend hours cooking a meal. I generally, I like really good food, but I don't want to spend, you know, half my afternoon making it. And so these recipes are really designed with busy women's schedules in mind. And there's lots of opportunities to batch cook, but we did a lot of taste testing. I have teenage boys. And so these recipes were very popular. And um, certainly I'm really proud of, of the work that Beth did and feel really grateful that we were able to collaborate together. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful too. And I know uh, those listeners who may become readers will be grateful mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you so much. So the last thing, while we're releasing this, if you are lucky enough to listen to it here, you're in pre-order mode. Where's the best place to get the book, first of all, but then two, you have some juicy bonuses. I do. I do. So it is being sold off of Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, uh, or your local bookstore. The really cool thing is that we've been dripping bonuses uh, about every other week. So um, the first bonus is Clean in 14, which is a program I used to run right before I would run IF45. And so now it is designed to really ramp up the results that you get from the program. Um, We have a bunch of fun, healthy clean desserts. Uh, there's a dessert guide that goes along with the book. Um, there's also a masterclass. So I'm going to be teaching a masterclass and this is content that's not in the book and the masterclass. And there's one other bonus that we haven't released yet. These things are not going to be available after publication date. So really what we've encouraged people to do is to let the book, uh, stores know that there's demand for the book. And, uh, in response to that, for people that are purchasing early, uh, they will have access to some pretty amazing bonuses. In fact, I'm working on the masterclass content right now. I'm really excited because I'm, you know, it's like, and Deb knows this about me, that I mm-hmm. tend to go down rabbit holes and I'm down a big rabbit hole right now prepping for a podcast I have tomorrow. And all of that information that I'm learning is going to be shared mm-hmm. with all of the women that purchase the book. So it's really a great opportunity to learn from me and have an opportunity to do a Q&A and all sorts of great things. But all of the pre-sale bonuses will go poof the day of publication. So you definitely want to jump on those. Fantastic. Okay. So listeners will put the link to uh, pre-order and how to get a hold of Cynthia. And Cynthia, just clarify, they buy the book, they will forward the receipt to you or how will they well, get the What they'll do is there's an opt-in on my website. So it's www.cynthiatherlow.com. You upload your receipt and that will give you access to the bonuses. Perfect. Love yeah, it. So super easy. And we decided we wanted it to be as easy as possible because my poor admin would, would probably <laughs> right. not be very happy with me if she had, you know, a couple thousand emails she had to go through with receipts. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible. Awesome. All right, listeners, there you have it. 
answers to intermittent fasting for women and questions you may have had or not known to ask. For information, more information on intermittent fasting for women, you can get the book and enjoy 45 days of guided step-by-step instruction and seriously delicious recipes. We'll have all the links that you need right here in the show notes, and that will be at flipping50.com forward slash intermittent fasting for women. What are you waiting for? Let's start Flipping 50 today.